because my wife uh, is currently in a lecture. She is, uh, she's also teaching at the university. And, um, and the kids are doing online schooling, which is a lot of fun. And here is what we are going to do today. So can you all see the screen? Yep, she teaches at Kent. And she even teaches some students who are in one of the other bioscience module. And there was a question, are, are there enzymes that are not sensitive to any conditions? No, basically not. <clears throat> well, she teaches uh, some students who are in the in the other module that I'm teaching. But I'm not telling anything. Is I think data protection and all that crap. She's also a bioscientist, I should say. And that's actually <laughs> that's actually how we met. We met in the lab, a lab romance. <laughs> I hope not. I hope they are not following uh, our in our footsteps. Although I told you, my son has decided uh, to do A levels, maths, biology, and chemistry. Yes, there was a lot of uh, chemistry, and I could I could uh, you know come up with really really cheesy quotes. Um, you know, I am a DNA helicase. Can I unzip your genes? But that's really bad. Okay, let's get started before I talk even more nonsense as than usual. <laughs> right, now, as you can see, uh, what we are going to do today, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it, the old ones are the good ones, right? So today we are doing all the things that you absolutely love, or maybe not. Uh, and um, please don't forget to register on Moodle. I'm not entirely sure is that... It should be, should be open. Uh, and Bernardo has uh, posted the link. So thank you very much, uh, Bernardo. That's great stuff. Now, today I'm doing this plots, statistics and Excel. And the reason for that is because last night I spent a lot of time um, to how shall I say that? To sort out a second year student who had was at the verge of a nervous breakdown. And the reason for that is the second year students are currently writing up what is called a mini project that they are doing, obviously in their second year, where they measure some enzyme kinetics. Surprise, surprise. And that poor sort, um, discovered something during this mini project that really shook his foundation of scientific belief. Okay. And uh, it, it was not pretty. 
And um, it took me a while, actually, to sort him out. So we did a little bit of uh, well-being first, you know, uh, all these uh, nice things that you say to students who are, you know, a mess and in tears. And um, then we went through, actually, what he found extremely disturbing. And luckily, luckily, at the end of this session, He was okay. He left quite happy with it. it had to he yeah. had to change the way he thinks about science. And that is what I really want to achieve with you today as well. So halfway through, I hope you will be there and think, oh my whatever. How is that going to work? And by the end of that session, uh, hopefully, I have, given you, I have given you the tools to sort out these problems, especially then when they come into the session. And I'll tell you what he found in a minute. So let's just recap what we did yesterday. I gave you, I, I showed you how we can, how we measure. So how to measure. Uh, this time course, and that is something that you are going to do either online uh, or uh, in a face to face practical. And I also then showed, showed you how to how to how to use Excel to create this line weaver, oops, line weaver Berg plot. Line weaver Berg plot. And today, what I want to do is I want to expand on that a little bit. And the time course actually is just simply where you measured the time and the corresponding absorbance. So that's that's what we did. Uh, what I showed you when I shouted at five, ten, fifteen uh, seconds on uh, this uh, website, uh, where I shouted the absorbance, and uh, that then um, we we recorded the uh, absorbances, and from that we did a straight line. We found the rate. And we use the rate then to do this line with a Berg plot. And it should be up on Ken Player on the left hand side uh, if you are on a PC or on a laptop, on the right hand side rather. And if you are on a tablet, then Ken Player recordings are right at the bottom of the Moodle page. So that's where we um, went yesterday. And hopefully, is it no? It's line weaver. Line. Line weaver. Berg plot. Okay. So, what what did this poor student find yesterday? Well, he actually recorded some data. So here he had the substrate concentration. Here he measured the rate. And at different substrate concentrations, he got different rates, right? That's, uh, that's pretty much what uh, we did yesterday. So it's always a good idea to do this plot. And let's just simply do a simple michaelis menten plot. That's, that's sort of the fail-safe thing. And this is just simply to check whether the enzyme really has michaelis menten behavior or whether something weird goes on. And we will come across uh, situations where weird things happen. If you, do, if you go straight into one of the linear plots, you probably will not necessarily see that something weird is going on. So a michaelis menten plot is a really good thing. Let's quickly do that. So I've highlighted the cells. 
I go to insert, I go to this scatter plot charts, and I just simply go for these data points. Okay, so here is the graph, and on the um, x-axis we plot the substrate concentration, and on the y-axis we plot the rate. And of course, I should give it the correct units, micromolar per minute. And here we have substrate concentration that is in micromolar. OK, so far so good. And you see this gives us a Michaelis Menten uh, plot. Um, what else do you see on that? Is it what you would expect the ideal plot? If it says no, why, why, why is it not? Why do you say no? It's the start of it. What do you mean? It has a slow start. Well, it has a slow start. That's what you would expect for a michaelis menten plot. Data is clustered at the beginning. Yeah, that's true. Well, we don't have a trend line. We can't do a trend line actually for curves. That's not possible. It needs to plateau. Well, we can't do that because we can't use more substrate. But are these plots on what you would expect to be a straight line or, or on, on a good line? Ah, there is, it looks like that, that there are some points out a little bit. So uh, what you actually see is if you just try to sort of come up with a good line through it, I just try to draw some by hand, something like that, you will find the data are not necessarily exactly on, uh, on a line uh, if, you, if you draw that. And to be perfectly honest, this is not unsurprising This is not surprising at all because we are doing experiments. So these data actually might have a little bit of uncertainty in measurements. And um, therefore, some data being out a little bit, but you know that 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 can that can happen. Well, the, the, this is life. And in fact, looking at this plot, it's not too bad actually. It, it, it gives us really all we need to know. So, what would you say is the Vmax for this guy? What do we get for Vmax as a rough estimate? Eighty. Ninety, 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 eighty-five-ish. So you see again, we have this problem that we really don't know. We don't know how this plot goes on. Will it go on like that or something like that? Maybe with experimental data or will it move up again? So it's really difficult to say. We probably have a good inkling that it is larger than 81, because that's sort of the last point that we've got here. And uh, but really, how this is going to move on, we have no idea. But I showed you yesterday how we can actually linearize that. And I showed you how we do this line with a Berg plot. So here are the data again. Let me just make them a little bit nicer. So here we are. And I showed you how we can convert that. 
And I showed you the equations that we can use. So we use just simply in Excel equals one over the substrate concentration here. And for the rate for a line with a Berg plot, we do again equals one over the rate. So we've got this one here. And because I'm too lazy to do the uh, put that into each cell, I just highlight the cells, look at the little black cross here, keep the left mouse button pressed and drag it down. And Excel will do all the calculations for me. Well, that's uh, very nice of you, Excel. Thank you very much. And it is magic. And it's fantastic. So, let's see how this plot looks like. Okay, and I've showed you how we do that yesterday. Insert, again, we go to charts and we go to scatter plot. And here is our line with a bug plot. And of course, we could make this a little bit nicer. Now we have a sort of a nice linearization. So this would be a line with a Berg plot. Here we plot one over the substrate concentration. And here we plot one over the rate. And the unit would be one over micro molar per minute. And here the unit would be one over micromolar. Okay. So this is what the line with a back plot looks like. Doesn't look too bad, actually. Now let's put in a trend line and let's get the uh, equation for this trend line. So we just simply click on data points so that they are all highlighted. Right mouse click, add trend line, and uh, we get our trend line here. So there's this one here. We display the equation and we get the R squared value that tells us how good the relationship between the independent and the dependent variables are. And this is what we get. And this is a nice and straight trend line uh, for linear trend line. So Excel actually calculates the differences of each point to a trend line. And uh, minimizes this difference. That is how Excel does this calculation. So that's our trend line. Now we see a couple of things here that are noteworthy. Are all our points on the trend line? Do all our data points lie on the trend line? Okay, so we probably have to deal with two different and separate issues. So Ella suggests outlier. That's an interesting one. So how many outliers do we have? OK, so people say one, and I assume you would say that this one here is potentially an outlier. Yeah, potentially. We would have to do proper statistical analysis to see whether this indeed is an outlier. I think it's probably it would be one. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a good point, but uh, it's relatively unlikely that we have one correct point and all the others are wrong. So, but uh, there is a chance that we might have more outliers. 
Don't take out outliers. Absolutely right. So be mindful of outliers. And we have another problem with this plot. And this other plot is, uh, and this other problem that we have is we've got a point here, this point here. Is it far, and I probably should, should not do it like that. Uh, where's my razor? There it is. Okay. Is this point far away from the trend line? Is it far away from the trend line? No. That's right. So we would probably not call this an outlier. So not outlier. However, this point, even if we have a, just a slight change, if we say, if we had measured it somewhere here, this point here would change how this gradient looks like. So this point here actually has a lot of influence. Has lot of influence on, oh, let's try that again. Nobody can read that. Lot of influence on the uh, position of the trend line. Yeah, that's why this point is called an influential influential point so we have an influential point this point has certainly more influence than for example this point here on the position of the trend line and if we have sort of different influences that's never a good thing. So with a line with a Berg plot, we inevitably always have an influential point right at the end. We could try to take that out, but then this point, the next point becomes an influential point. So every time we have a point right at the end for a line with a Berg plot, we have an influential point, and an influential point is something that is still on the trend line, but that is far away or relatively far away from the rest of the data points. So this point here, or these points here, are fairly far away from the rest of the data points, and therefore they have a really massive influence about on the trend line. We also have another problem because what we see here is that we have what is called the bunching of data. Bunching. Our data are crowded here and spread out in the other area here. And statistically, this means there is bias. This would be more coursework, yeah, absolutely. So this is a problem, isn't it, with this line with a Berg plot? Okay, nevertheless, let's see what we get in terms of data. So we have our equation here. Let me move that here. So what we find for this trend line is 0 0.0102, and that is our one over Vmax equals 0 0.0102. That's this one here, that's the intercept, in, intersect here with the axis, with the y-axis. And our gradient that we have here, 
that's this guy here, that is Km over Vmax in a line with a Berg plot. This gives us 0 0.5 324. Okay? So these are the parameters that we get. Of course, we want V max. So all we need to do is we just simply take this value here and take it one over this value. So we would get equals one divided by 0 0.0102. And that gives us our Vmax value. So our Vmax value is 98 micromolar per minute. Km, we just simply take this value and multiply it with our Vmax. So that is 0 0.5324 times this value. 98, and it gives us a Km of 52, right? Does that make sense? I think that's what I showed you also yesterday. So, oh, no, that's not what I wanted, sorry. I did not want that. I wanted this one here, yeah. So these are our two values that we got here. And let me just do it like that. Okay, so these are the two values that we are interested in. Vmax is 98 uh, micromolar and the Km is 52 micromolar. That's what we got from this line with a Berg plot. And that is what the student yesterday got. So, and the 0 0.012, that is what the equation gives me here all for the trend line. And Vmax, from 1 over Vmax, we discussed that yesterday, you just simply do 1 over 1 over Vmax. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> yeah, that looks good, doesn't it? Okay, so this is what the student got yesterday. And he said, well, but I know that there are problems with a line with a Berg plot. So let me just simply try a different plot. Let's try the Eddie Hofstey plot. And just uh, as a reminder, in an Eddie Hofstey plot, we plot V over S on the X axis and V on the Y axis. And we get uh, something like that. The gradient gives us negative Km. And if we extend this line, this point here gives us Vmax. And this is really the things that we are interested in. So let's quickly do that in Excel because it's easy to do. So first of all, we need to calculate V, the rate divided by S. That's easy enough. So all we need to do is we calculate rate divided by S. And for the rate, that's what we plot on the y-axis, we just simply put in the values that we have here, like that. And because I'm too lazy to do all the calculations and put that in by hand, I just highlight the cells and do the same thing that I did with the line with a Berg plot. What do you mean the other way? This is called the Eddie Hofstey plot, but I'll write that down. Don't worry. 
So here we've got our, our data. And now let's, let's do the plot for that. So scatter plot. Oh, look at that. Okay, we got a plot here. So this is an AD proof state plot. Okay, so here we got it. Now, and the axis, the axis we plot V over S. And here we've got, oops, we've got the rate V. And V is the rate that we found from our time course. So, right. Now, what do we notice about that? Is that a straight line as we would expect? Does it give us a straight line? No. You're absolutely right. We have some points away from what we would probably see. So let's do the trend line thing. So highlight the dots, right click, add trend line. So here we've got a trend line. We display the equation and the R square value. So that's what we get. Actually, <clears throat> Here's a neat trick. If you want this line to extend, what you can do is when you have the trend line selected, you can go to this backward thing here. Do you see that? That's the backward thing. And we extend the line 0 0.5 units in this case into this direction. That's actually really nice, nice trick. So 0 0.5. Oh, let's do it 0 0.6. Oh, you see, we can extend the line so that it actually crosses the line and gives us a nice intercept. And likewise, we could do that uh, with here. Uh, just doing it with forward, but I'm too lazy. So what do we see? We've got outliers. So our plot does not look as good as, for example, the line with a Berg plot here, without uh, all my scribbles. The line with a Berg plot gives us, you know, a better sort of behavior when it comes to the trend line. And we've got a fairly high value for the correlation, whereas in the Eddie Hofstede plot, what we find is we have a much lower correlation here. Right? You see that? Lower correlation. So the points are not really good on the trend line, or not perfect on the trend line, but they are still giving us some decent values. Now, the nice thing, however, is do we have, yes, we have outliers. We pr probably this one is an outlier. Do we have any influential points on here? Do we have any influential points on an Eddie Hofstede plot? What do you think? Yes? Are there any data points that are far away from the other data points? Mm, this one here, that would probably be an outlier. But otherwise, we don't have any influential points. So no influential points. no influential points. Do we have bunching of data? 
are our data sort of biased? Excellent. No bunching. And statistically, this is far more robust than a line with a Berg plot. So let's get our Vmax and Km for this Eddie Hofstey plot. And that's even easier. That's even easier than the line with a Berg plot because in an Eddie Hofstey plot, we just simply can read it off. So this here, our gradient, that is our negative Km. So here that would be 58.52, 58.52. And the intersect except, would be 108.97. Okay, so these are our Vmax and Km values. Are you happy with that? We found Vmax and Km. Looks good, doesn't it? And this is where the student had the breakdown yesterday. And I'll show you why. Look at the Vmax value. 108.97. Let's go back to our line with a Berg plot. 108.97. Our Vmax here is 98. Shouldn't it be the same? Okay, let's, uh, maybe we made a mistake somewhere. Let's look at the Km. Km for the line with a Berg is 52. For the Eddie Hofstede, it's 58. Do you see the problem? We have done, we have used exactly the same data points. You see, here line with a Berg, here Eddie Hofstede plot, exactly the same data point, but it gives us different Vmax, gives a different Km. And this is where the student was, holy crap, this can't be. All we have done is just simply all we have done is exactly the linearization. We have used linear forms, and again, Km is the gradient in an Eddie Hofstede plot. So that's this value here, 58.52. We ignore the minus and write that down. So this one here, this is the value for Km. And here, this one is the value for Vmax. The line with a Berg plot. So we had this discussion, line with a Berg or Eddie Hofstede. One is lying, or maybe both are lying. And on the line with a Berg, how do you work out Km? So what you do is, in order to get Km, you just simply say Km equals Km over Vmax, that was the gradient times Vmax. Because the Vmax cancels out and we've got the Km. So that's the value for the gradient and that is one over the intercept. So one of these plots or both are lying. So they give us different results. They are not terribly difficult, they're different, but they are different. Undoubtedly, aren't they? How come that if we do 
the same thing, basically. If we use the same data, we come to different results. Hmm. Any suggestions? What is happening here? This goes against the, you know, our scientific belief. If we do the same thing twice, uh -huh. we have absolutely right. We have experimental, actually we have experimental errors and both plots deal with experimental errors in a different way. And I think Vernon has uh, said it really nicely. We see this because we've got different R squared values. So both plot deal with experimental data in a different ways. So if you look at a line weaver berg plot, characteristic for a line weaver berg plot is it makes makes bad data look good. That is why it's incredibly, incredibly popular with scientists. Even if you have shite data, uh, it looks like pretty much a straight line. Yeah, okay, and gives you a very high R square value. So uh, good correlation. On the other hand, an Eddie Horst day plot makes good data makes good data look bad. But it is statistically much better. So which one should we use? makes good no it make it look it makes good data if we've got good data they're still sort of they look like much worse than the uh, line with a bird plot whereas in a line with a bird plot even if you put in bad data you will come up with a good plot in an Eddie Hofstey plot if you put in good data it will still it still doesn't look t terribly good. So which one should we use? Well, actually, what we can do, I would always go for an Eddie Hope's Day because I think this is more honest. But an Eddie Hope's Day plot has an added advantage, sort of, because we don't have any massive statistical issues with that. What we can do is we can apply statistical analysis to that. Because what we are doing is we are doing one experiment. We have one sample, if you like, and the sample is these measurements. This is our sample. And before we just had, you know, one sort of sample set. When we, for example, looked at Poisson distribution, at the number of raisins in the bagel, here we have a correlation. So we have basically still one sample, but they are correlated. But it is a sample. And you know what we can do with samples? With samples, whenever we have a sample, we can actually find a 95% confidence interval. Whenever we have samples, So what we can do, we can use our Eddie Hofstede plot because it does not have 
the statistical problem that I just highlighted in the Lineweaver-Berg. The Lineweaver-Berg plot, we have influential point, we have bunching of data, uh, and it also gives us what we are looking for in the wrong format. It doesn't give us Vmax, it gives us one over Vmax. Right? So, what we can do is we can try and find a 95% confidence interval for KM and also a 95% confidence interval for Vmax. How on earth are we going to do that? And this is where Excel is absolutely brilliant because Excel can do that for you without any problems. Do you want me to show you how to do that? Right, now, most of you probably already have that installed. If not, no, it's not multiple populations. It is, this is just one sample, but the data are correlated with each other. Tomorrow, we could do exactly the same experiment and we would have the same substrate concentrations, but we would probably find slightly different rates. So that would be another sample. Now, what you need to do in order to get this confidence interval is something that is called linear regression analysis. Linear regression analysis. And luckily, Excel has a function for that. But the function is hidden. So the way you find that is you go to data, and then you go over on your data tab to something that's called data analysis. This is a special tool pack, data analysis tool pack, data analysis tool pack. There are a number of YouTube videos out there. If you haven't got it installed, then I will post a link how you can install it. Data analysis tool pack. So let's go to that data analysis tool pack. I've already got it installed. So it opens this window here and I want to do regression. Click OK. Let me just things. Okay, so it will ask you for some information. Input y range, that is what we plotted on the y axis, right? And that is what we plotted here on the y axis. So I highlighted left mouse click. And you see the cells that I just highlighted show up here in this range. Input X range. I take the label and drag it down. Can you see this tab here that I just moved? Ah, let me see, really? Where is it? Hmm. 
No? Okay, don't you worry, I have That's interesting. Don't worry, I have a regression analysis tool uh, video, which I will post that goes through this process. And uh, is the screen gone? Aha. Uh -huh. Right, let me see if we can go back to that. So data analysis, regression. Can you see this window here now? No. Don't worry, I'll post a, a video, but what I want to show you is the output of that. The output of this regression analysis looks like this here. Let me increase that a little bit. Let me increase this. Can you see that, this gray bit? Yeah, this gives you a lot and lots of information. What we are really interested in is four things. Four things we are interested in. We get our intercept that is here Vmax. And we get our gradient, that is Km. And we can just simply ignore the minus. Now you see here, we get a lower and an upper bound. So here we have lower bound. And here we have got an upper bound. Brilliant, thank you very much, Ed Miller. And the gradient is this V over S, exactly. That's the gradient. So what does it tell us? It tells us that our V max from the Eddie Hofstede plot is somewhere between 78.5, I just round up, to 139.5. This is this confidence interval. Do you see that? That is the confidence interval for Vmax. So we are pretty sure that the true value for Vmax as seen for this one experiment, the true value for Vmax for this one experiment is somewhere between 78 and 140 or something like that. Like we have done that for the confidence interval of the bagels yesterday. Km, We have here between 33 and 84 and 84. So all we can say is we think that Vmax for this particular experiment is in this range between, let's say, 78 and 140, and Km is somewhere between 33 and 84. And you ignore the minus uh, totally, 
uh, because we know that it is the gradient is minus km, so we just uh, ignore the, the, the negative things uh, totally. So that means, let's look again at our Eddy Hofstede plot. For the Eddy Hofstede plot, we got a Vmax of 109. 109 is pretty much bang in the middle here. For the line with a work plot, we got a Vmax of 98. Again, 98 is pretty much bang in the middle of our estimate of this confidence interval for Vmax. So what we really should say is, it doesn't matter whether we use a line with a Berg or a Hofstede plot, as long as we can identify this confidence interval, we can say we believe that Vmax is somewhere in here between. And both plots actually give us something pretty much in the middle. Likewise for Km, for the Eddy Hofstede plot, we said Km is 58. 58 is in the middle here. For the Line Weaverberg plot, we said Km is 52. So again, 52 is in here. So what we would report back is that for these data that we looked at, for these data, we would say our Vmax is between 79 and what was the other one? 79 and 140. and 140. And it does not matter which plot we use. Km is between 33 and 84. So the take home message is Excel allows you to plot these data very nicely. And also you can perform on an Eddy Hofstede plot. You can't do that with a line with a Berg plot, but on an Eddy Hofstede plot, you can do the statistical analysis with regression. Well, good, good question. How can it be less? And the answer is, this is experimental uncertainty. This could be you know, slightly out. This is an estimate where we believe the value to be. Maybe this is an outlier. So we've done the plots. I will post the link to how you do the regression analysis. And this is how you actually find Vmax and Km. Ideally, you would use an Eddy Hofstede plot my advice would be hands off a line with a Berg plot. Uh, I suppose you can write it probably like that, yes. Yep. Although I would say you probably should indicate that this is a 95% confidence interval. This is how you do it. Next week, we are starting a new topic. We are starting the topic of enzyme inhibitors, and I've got some videos uh, on the playlist. So if you want to have a sneak peek on inhibitors, have a look at these different inhibitors on the playlist. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching, and I wish you all a wonderful weekend, and don't forget to do the test. Inhibitors, yes, oh God, inhibitors, that's great stuff. Okay, take care. And sorry for overrunning. Enjoy your afternoon. Be good. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. <laughs> right. Cool. So. And if I find this dog who just farted again, this is disgusting. <laughs>